Through Zoo Archaeological Symphonies, we tried to bring the zoo archaeological reports from the site, which are usually the grayest of the gray literature, to life. There was another project, Voices Recognition, wherein we tried to embed the voices of the dead people within their tombstones at York Cemetery using geolocated oral augmented reality. So when you got closer to the place where someone was buried, the noise got louder. The trick was that we didn't just have one voice going, we had them all on at the same time, so it sounded like walking into a room at a party. The interesting thing about this was that we found out there were several mass graves at the cemetery, so when people using the app walked across what looked like open green space, we had a large amount of unintelligible voices all talking at the same time, reanimating the landscape. Listen to a bit of the project now. And it changes to and it's a, a movie. Right. That Many was the prime thing, if you like, was an extension of our history of time. And carrying the feeding of children, then the whole world comes escalated at a better pace than we really are. On his joint, I'm going to go with fish and chips on a wound. I'm going to go with fish and chips on a wound. My name is William Rowley, of York, not his son. That's another William Rowley. I'm a butcher's son. Son of the shambles, the great flesh shambles. Mark. The pie or a cottage pie. Butchers were very, very good to us. Bakers. Finally, there have been several projects using oralization, which allows acoustic environments to be reproduced. In this, you build a 3D model of the space and then are able to orally reconstruct what different noises must have sounded like in this space. I've linked to the Listening to the Commons project, which aims to recover the soundscape of debate as experienced by women listening through a ventilator in the old House of Commons from 1800 to 1834. It was a collaborative project which highlighted the history of women's participation in politics by developing and adapting visual models of the 1834 House of Commons into acoustic models to create contemporary oralizations or oral reconstructions of speeches and debate. So, since women were not allowed inside the House of Commons, they had to listen to the debates through a vent, and this oralization recreates how that would have sounded. Another project reconstructed the architecture of St. Mary's Abbey, the ruin in the museum gardens behind the King's Manor, they had a live choir, but altered the singing to sound like it was inside the former abbey. Each singer wore a headset microphone and, using interactive oralization, was able to sing their line, tuned carefully to the acoustic properties of the 3D model through the reconstructed acoustics of the ruined space. So, if you think about it, you may be able to re-inject an opera singer into St. Mary's Abbey or what it might have sounded like almost anywhere just by creating the 3D model and doing this kind of oralization. So we've discussed digitally animating the dead through bots and soundscapes, but what about if you could filter your experience of space, the landscape, archaeological sites, through the bodily affordances of dead people? Increasingly, we've been digitally reanimating the dead to play roles in movies, to sell chocolate, or in Joey Ramone's case, Doc Martens. Carrie Fisher's death did not prevent her from starring in the last Star Wars movie, and in the York Art Gallery there is a screen showing deepfakes, Trump, Obama, and others synthetically recreated as art. It's a broader question, really. What use is archaeology when you don't die? I have been interested in avatars and archaeology for over 10 years, and the latest iteration of this interest is in the Other Eyes project. I was inspired by the quote from Proust, The only true voyage of discovery, the only fountain of eternal youth, would be not to visit strange lands, but to possess other eyes, to behold the universe through the eyes of another, of a hundred others, to behold the hundred universes that each of them beholds. Avatars are interesting to think with. 
The experiences I had while running around as a Neolithic person in Chatelhoyek in Second Life were singular, fascinating, and unsettling, but there was very little verisimilitude. The avatars we designed were based on somewhat vague notions of what people might may have looked like. Indeed, these decisions were part of the learning process. As I previously mentioned, investigating archaeological data for reconstructions is one of the best ways to query this record. The omissions and the failures in thinking are immediately apparent. But they did not reflect any particular person, these avatars, but a range of experiences and people who inhabited Chatelhuyuk. Through working with the Eurotas Project, a Marie Curie initial training network as a postdoc, I found archaeologists investigating individuals to a high level of detail through examining skeletal remains, ancient DNA, and isotopic analyses. Bioarchaeological life histories are increasingly common, but have rarely been translated to digital archaeology. Several years after I initially became interested in this concept, I received funding from the AHRC for the Other Eyes Project. The Other Eyes Project aims to better understand and transmit the experiences of past people using virtual embodiment and immersive technologies. We draw from bioarchaeological life histories to create avatars based on human-era skeletons excavated in York. These human remains have shown that many past people experienced altered mobility, whereas reconstructions privilege a normative, able-bodied perspective. By creating avatars from bioarchaeological evidence, we aim to fundamentally alter how academics and the general public understand and interpret the past. We seek to understand the history, context, and ethics of reconstructing past people from a multicultural viewpoint and explore the capacity for these reconstructions to evoke empathetic responses from present people. With project partners Beta Jester and the Yorkshire Museum, we will explore the use of avatars within a mixed reality setting and encourage engagement from audiences who may not otherwise engage with archaeological research. Right, so you have made your amazing digital project. What comes next? Unfortunately, experimenting with technology and archaeology often creates projects that are quickly outdated and resigned to the digital rubbish heap. A few years ago, Bath lecturer Matt Law and I decided to look at digital obsolescence through the old website host GeoCities in 2009. GeoCities was once the most common hosting service for low-cost personal web pages, including hundreds of public outreach sites about archaeology. Though there are many attempts to save this data, online content is incredibly fragile, and if you use it and if you use for-profit platforms, your project probably will die. But maybe that's okay. People are afraid that the horrible photos posted of themselves when they were 14 will stick around forever. If they are truly horrible, then maybe they will. But hosting things online is not permanent, and it is not an archive. This is a particularly troubling problem for us archaeologists, as we destroy our research subject through excavation and preserve through documentation. And so what happens when this digital documentation is incredibly fragile? As I mentioned before, the Archaeology Data Service is amazing. It's hosted within the Department of Archaeology at York, and it's an incredibly rich resource and is deeply important. The ADS is one entity that is fighting against a digital dark age, so a lot of our digital archaeological data has been created with few plans of migration or storage. The ADS is a vast online digital archive. Archaeological projects in the UK are required to deposit their data, and the ADS is one of the few places that can take these many forms of digital data. There is an accompanying journal, Internet Archaeology, that is excellent, and the ADS hosts student volunteers and dissertations. It's an incredible resource that sadly few students seem to know about. So know it, love it, and archive your data. Thank you so much for accompanying me and James through this course. I hope it was at least mildly entertaining and possibly educational. If you're interested in any of these topics for a dissertation, please do let me or James know.